Stanley Kubrick is unquestionably one of the greatest filmmakers in the history of cinema. His sharp social satire, untraditional framing techniques, and complex storylines distinguished him as an auteur whose style continues to be replicated and repeated decades after his death. An infamous perfectionist, he was the epitome of excellence and perfection, and the sense of beauty that could be gathered with every viewing of his movies is second to none. Although his filmography isn't as expansive as those of his contemporaries, he more than made up for that with quality. Each film he directed was a product of detailed planning and masterful execution, and not a single one of them is like the other. With so many timeless classics to consider, here is our ranking of Stanley Kubrick's top 10 films. I've still got the greatest enthusiasm and confidence in the mission, and I want to help you. Number 10, Lolita. The film which gave birth to Kubrick's enduring reputation for controversy was this adaptation of the equally controversial novel by Vladimir Nabokov. Following the relationship between a teenage girl and the middle-aged man who marries her mother in order to get closer to her, Lolita isn't as shocking or outrageous as one might expect despite its loaded subject matter. In fact, the understated nature of how this predatory relationship proceeds is something Kubrick utilizes for darkly comedic effect. His adaptation steers away from the novel's more outrageous aspects and leaves much of the material up to implication, whether it's the choice of words or the ensemble's expressive body language. It exudes the vibe of a classic black and white thriller, one that culminates in the unmasking of the culprit's identity. Although, in another of his surprising deviations, Kubrick decided to make the novel's ending, in which the oddly named Humbert Humbert's obsession drives him to murder, the first scene of the film. What ultimately elevates Lolita is how Kubrick's creative decisions enhance the level of intrigue we have in otherwise deplorable characters, and how he crafts their circumstances as a satirical parable of lust taken way too far. You're crazy. Why am I doubting? Because, my darling, when my darling mother finds out, she's going to divorce you and strangle me. Number 9. The Killing The Killing was a breakthrough film for Kubrick, as it was the first to bring his experimental filmmaking techniques into the limelight. This bittersweet neo-noir follows career thief Johnny Clay as he plans one last heist around a racetrack before settling down. The plan is perfect, and everything goes as it should, but even then, it's not enough to keep things from unraveling in spectacular fashion an incredibly well-paced and well-shot film that reminds the viewer of just how quickly the world moves even when we think we understand everything about it. The Killing never hesitates to subvert audience expectations with its inclusion of femme fatales and a host of red herrings. Kubrick's use of flashbacks and non-linear storytelling adds additional layers to an already complex story. No one saw the duffel bag come out of the window. and is credited with inspiring the likes of Quentin Tarantino and Christopher Nolan, who would go on to popularize the technique in the 1990s and early 2000s. Despite being only his third film, The Killing launched Kubrick to international recognition due to his competent direction, which helped elevate it above the trappings of a typical Hollywood film. And there's one more thing. Suppose by accident you do get picked up. What are you done? You shot a horse. It isn't first degree murder. In fact, it isn't even murder. In fact, I don't know what it is. Number eight, Full Metal Jacket. Kubrick's penultimate feature was also the last of several anti-war films he made throughout his career. This irreverent but shocking take on the Vietnam War arrived in the wake of many other classics such as The Deer Hunter, Apocalypse Now, and Platoon, but Full Metal Jacket has found its own place in the public imagination due to its atypical structure. The first section of the film showcases the basic training of U.S. Marines at Paris Island before abruptly shifting to the city of Hue during the Tet Offensive. Although the film has found its share of critics for this very reason, both halves use dark humor and a slow pace to mask the senselessness of violence. Full Metal Jacket is one of Kubrick's most technically precise films, and its meditation on those who go off to fight wars that aren't theirs offers some of the most potent storytelling of its time. Why is Private Pyle out of his bunk after lights out? Why is Private Pyle holding that weapon? Why aren't you stopping Private Pyle's guts out? Sir. It is the private's duty to inform the senior drill instructor that Private Pyle has a full magazine and is locked and loaded, sir! Through the 
the eyes of the resilient yet vulnerable private Joker, the viewer becomes witness to the debilitating and unforgiving effects of war firsthand. The dead know only one thing. It is better to be alive. It's a film that's at times unfocused and confusing, and the central conflict is ultimately unresolved. But then again, so was the Vietnam War. Number seven, Paths of Glory. Full Metal Jacket may be Kubrick's most well-known film about war, but Paths of Glory is his most tender. Set against the backdrop of World War I-era France, this fan favorite centers around Colonel Dax as he defends three innocent soldiers who are court-martialed after refusing to partake in a suicide mission. Will the prosecutor question the witnesses without even reading the indictment? Please don't take up the court's time with technicalities. The indictment is lengthy, and there's no point in reading it. Well, the defense has a right to know the exact accusation. The indictment is that the accused showed cowardice in the face of the enemy during the attack on the ant hill. Sadly, his efforts aren't enough, as the resulting kangaroo court finds him ostracized from his fellow higher-ups for treating his men as more than pawns. Another technical marvel, this is an uncommonly gritty and realistic take on trench warfare, and is perhaps the earliest evidence of how Kubrick was able to marry his pitch-perfect attention to detail with his proclivity for using long takes. Dominated by Kirk Douglas's commanding presence and mired in tragedy, Kubrick strips paths of glory of any kind of wartime heroism. By its heart-wrenching finale, this just might be the most human and universal film Kubrick ever made. Ready? Aim! Fire! Number 6. The Shining The Shining is one of the most visually haunting and unsettling pieces of horror ever put to film. The film follows recovering alcoholic Jack Torrance as he, his wife Wendy, and their psychic son Danny take over as the winter caretakers of the Overlook Hotel. As Jack's writer's block grows and Danny's premonitions become stronger, Things take a turn for the worst after Jack unearths a slew of ghostly terrors the hotel has been keeping hidden. This film remains one of Kubrick's best because the director's deeply disillusioned outlook on life finds some of its best use right here. After all, there are few things more distrustful than an unstable man slowly descending into snowbound madness in the company of his family. Although this adaptation was infamously condemned by author Stephen King, it allowed Kubrick to set an entirely new standard for what horror filmmaking could achieve, both visually and psychologically. From its spectacular production values to its pioneering use of Steadicam, The Shining is a true trendsetter whose accomplishments frequently transcend its genre trappings. Less about the dark spirits inhabiting the nooks and crannies of the hotel than it is about a fractured family slowly losing their grip on reality, Kubrick creates a sense of unwavering dread long before Jack Nicholson goes off the deep end in his terrifying lead performance. Here's Johnny! <laughs> Misunderstood in its time and rightfully reevaluated, The Shining makes for such an overwhelming experience that it's possible it may have been too much for a world that wasn't ready for it. Number 5, 2001, A Space Odyssey. As a trailblazer of symbolic imagery, Kubrick's status as a filmmaker was forever boosted following the release of 2001, A Space Odyssey. Considered by many to be his greatest achievement, if not one of the greatest achievements in cinematic history. Defying logic on all accounts, the journey of a mysterious monolith takes the viewer on a journey from the dawn of man to the moon to the outskirts of Jupiter to goodness knows where else. The film is both a vision of the future and a window into the past, a criticism of technological overbearance and an insight into the search for a creator. But more than anything, it's a richly metaphorical text that's still engaging as an outer space adventure. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about, Hal? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. Laying the groundwork for nearly all modern depictions of space travel to follow, 
the technical innovations of 2001 A Space Odyssey are made even more impressive considering the film was released a full year before the Apollo 11 moon landing. Number 4. Barry Lyndon One of Kubrick's longest, slowest, and undoubtedly most challenging films, Barry Lyndon is also a film whose finer qualities will never be appreciated with just a single watch. In fact, it's only with a second watch that you begin to realize that this story about an Irish gambler working his way through the British class system into an aristocratic family, with a complete lack of regard for who he tramples to get there, is meant to be long, slow, and challenging. One. Two. Three. <laughs> The plot is laden with a plethora of misadventures, erotically charged subplots, gripping violence, greed, and unexpected twists confirming Kubrick's status as a formidable storyteller in his own right. Between the authentic dialogue and Kubrick's unprecedented decision to shoot the film using only natural light, it's a period film that goes to great lengths to remind you it's a period film. Have you done with my lady? I beg your pardon. Come, come, sir. I'm a man who would rather be known as a cuckold than a fool. With incredible set pieces and costumes that could only be described as accurate, the verisimilitude between Barry Lyndon and 18th century Rococo art has contributed mightily to the film's artistic merits. Number three, A Clockwork Orange. Kubrick brings a dystopian nightmare to life in this adaptation of another infamous novel. Stop it, stop it, please, I beg you! true cult classic, A Clockwork Orange follows the iconic, psychopathic Alex DeLarge as he and his merry band of droogs torture and pillage their community before being forced into a behavioral conditioning program. Kubrick brings some of his most noticeable flourishes to this film, especially his unbridled skill in world building, as he envisions a futuristic England in which otherworldly rebellion and totalitarian order juxtapose one another in a never-ending battle for free will. It's the only one of Kubrick's films ever to receive an X rating, and with the protagonist's proclivity for committing unspeakable acts of ultra-violence on full display, it's not hard to see why. It's by no means an easy watch, but it's also a work of painstaking yet stunning craftsmanship, even by Kubrick standards. Number two, Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bum. What's always made Kubrick such a fascinating filmmaker is that despite the dark subject matter he frequently tackled, he never failed to have a sense of humor. You can't fight in here, this is the war room. What is going on here? I demand an explanation. <laughs> this clumsy fool tried to plant that ridiculous camera on me. Yeah, you bet your sweets, Mr. Commie. Look at this, Mr. President, this lousy commie rat was taking pictures with this thing of the big boar. Nowhere is that better demonstrated than in Dr. Strangelove. His satirical vision of mutually assured destruction and the snowballing political tensions of the Cold War. Shot in black and white, the story follows a group of political leaders as they attempt to stop the paranoid General Jack D. Ripper from launching a nuclear attack on the Soviet Union. What results is a series of passionate discussions, comedic debates, and absurd resolutions mired in scathing wit. Peter Sellers gives an all-time great performance covering three separate roles, Royal Air Force Captain Lionel Mandrake, U.S. President Merkin Muffley, and the hilariously creepy ex-Nazi scientist Dr. Strangelove. He quite literally dominates every scene he's in, providing the sardonic comedic timing that allows his more dramatic co-stars George C. Scott and Sterling Hayden to shine as well, in ways often unintentional. He coats the story with powerfully subtle imagery, and it remains one of his most impressive achievements that his intent to smear contemporary governments for their unwillingness to make peace remains just as relevant today as it was then. If, on the other hand, we were to immediately launch an all-out and coordinated attack on all their airfields and missile bases, we'd stand a damn good chance of catching them with their pants down. Hell, we got a 5 to one missile superiority as it is. We could easily assign three missiles to every target and still have a very effective reserve force for any other contingency. Number one, Eyes Wide Shut. As Kubrick's final film before his passing, Eyes Wide Shut marked the director's ultimate attempt at displaying his directorial mastery on screen. 
The themes and characters are his most divisive, and the imagery his most controversial. And given that press surrounding the film hailed it as the grand finale Kubrick's career had been leading to, it's likely he wouldn't have had it any other way. The film follows Dr. Bill Harford and his determination to have a sexual encounter upon hearing his wife Alice divulge sexual fantasies about a man from her past. Millions of years of evolution. Right? Right? Men have to stick it in every place they can, but for women, women it is just about security and commitment and whatever the fuck else. It's a testament to Kubrick's talent as a filmmaker that he's able to make a character like Harford and the situations he finds himself in even remotely palatable. In classic Kubrick fashion, it's an experience in which we never know where he's leading us and what the ultimate payoff will be. Along the way, he does his absolute best to paint a picture of who we are as people by engaging with the inherent relationship between sex, class, and masculinity. The motley of interpretations and the immense subjectivity with which Kubrick presents Harford's journey remain the most alluring characteristics of this ultra-cryptic film. It's only fitting that Kubrick's last present to filmgoers was both a somewhat self-reflexive commentary and a mystery that could never be solved. So, those were our picks for Stanley Kubrick's top 10 films. His masterfully crafted filmography blazed a trail for a generation of filmmakers to learn from, and the mark he left on cinema is beyond comparison. Do you agree with our ranking? What's your favorite Stanley Kubrick film? Comment down below to let us know.